Hello, we're here. Onward, Hello. onward. Hello, my <laughs> friends and family, groundlings and royals, my luckers and lovers. Welcome to Hang with Hello, Hillary. We're here. Onward, onward. Hello, oh, my me. friends. That was me. That was me, because it's only our second show. Come on, let's hang with me and David. Welcome, welcome. Hey. There's David. <laughs> Good to see everyone again. So happy. Our first show was so much fun. Glad to be back. <laughs> and David Malbo, my co-host. So we like to say that, you know, Johnny Carson had Ed McMahon, David Letterman had Paul Schaefer. I've got David Malbo. So welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're joining because you follow Sign with Robert, um, I'm still still here. I'm still Hillary, and we want to like encourage you to keep on watching. We will have some deaf guests in the future, and hopefully, this show is captioned. So please continue to watch and join. Okay, because uh, during the pandemic, we had to pivot to new things. So everyone who knows me from signing and the deaf community, I'm here as myself. Okay, I'm going to stop signing now and let the captions take over. So, um, that means love, right? It does. Well, we all know it's, it's a universal gesture, which we all know and appreciate. So, um, since now I'm, I'm learning this YouTube lingo, uh, that I'm supposed to encourage everyone to subscribe and then, um, we can let you know when I am live, which is normally every Friday. It's normally every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Um, today's the one exception of a Thursday because we had some things going on in the world yesterday that we all needed to pay attention to. But uh, here we are today on Thursday, our second show only. Next week, next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have Chicago's funny man, Bill Larkin. Um, if you like our music that we play during the show, Go ahead and you'll see a link come up from Epidemic. And if you go ahead and subscribe to them and get your own free royalty free music, um, you will, um, uh, we'll be able to have more gifts to give away to you guys. Okay, so without much further ado, today's guest, our very first guest, David, I cannot believe this. I'm excited. Um, a longtime friend, funny man, Michael butler murray he's a professional actor narrator and musician who was voiced over a hundred audiobooks he was born in long island new york and has been performing his entire life like 80 years at least <laughs> uh notable credits include the broadway national tour of mamma mia which we'll hear about a little bit later dozens of productions oh my gosh he's got stories Dozens of productions of Pump Boys and Dinettes. I Love My Wife, Jason Alexander, Johnny Guitar at La Mirada, and As You Like It at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. Film credits include Clint Eastwood's Jersey Boys and Frontera starring Ed Harris. So David, I'm gonna have you cut our music because I thought the best intro would be to see him um, doing what he, is great at which is acting so we have a little clip to, to introduce michael before we bring him out from one of his short films called the truth seeker it's 90 seconds long so it's a minute and a half and uh i think there's one or two swear words so if there's any children or nieces or nephews watching just a disclaimer we're a pretty clean show but sometimes we slip an occasional f-bomb in there i think there's only one or two up top nothing harmful and uh, there is no violence. There looks like there could be violence, but there is no violence in this scene. See, I try to take care of my viewers. Okay. Oh, Trey liked the tunes. Thank you, Trey. We're gonna have more tunes. You just wait. Just wait. We've got way more tunes coming out. So. Tan Tigress likes our background. Thank you. Welcome yes, to our and set. hi, Robin. I'm so glad yeah, you're watching. I'm looking at the comments now. So Here's thank you. Set. So the whole set, David built it himself in, I think, a day. And we got more. But We've got more. All right, so without much further ado, let's go ahead to the screening room and let's watch a little bit of Michael Butler Murray in The Truth Seeker. 
It's all about fucking you, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe for once I have something I'd like to get off my chest, okay? S sorry. Oh, forget it. Sorry. You people are so apologetic. Don't be sorry. Be proactive. I mean, do something. Help me. Instead of focusing on yourself for two fucking seconds. Okay. L let me try that again. I'm listening. What were you going to say? No, 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 no. Moments pass. Let's just get back to it. Come on. Please. I, I really want to know. No. I'm just saying that so I don't burn a hole in your fucking cheek. That's fair. But I, uh, I, can, I can tell you're carrying something. And I'm, I'm betting in your line of work, you may not get so many opportunities to unload. Yeah. yeah. You got that right. <laughs> I just feel like I have more to offer than this. And you know how it is. You get into a job and you can't leave because, you know, the pay is okay, but you never get ahead and then you just stay in it. I mean, I'm really good at it, right? And that's rewarding, but... Ah. I don't know. What? No, it's, it's stupid. Oh, come on. That was and awesome. that was the clip of the truth seeker. I, <laughs> I love that. And let's bring out Michael Butler Murray, the man himself. Welcome, welcome, yeah, welcome. Good job great. on that, Mike. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I ever saw that film before. So welcome. When did you shoot that? Uh, I think two years ago. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. And Trey yeah. is saying that it was shot in New York. Is that true? No, that's not true. I shot that. We shot that at a place called Fabric Flame Proofing, which is a place I worked at for several years. It was a side gig. And uh, it's just the place is it's kind of a disaster all the time. So when we thought like, oh, we need some kind of scary warehouse, I was like, ah, I got just the thing. <laughs> Now you guys have to know that Michael also writes and directs and he does some of his own short films. So like, how how did it feel like acting and, oops, we got bad reception there for a second. That wi -Fi. It's an old TV, it's an old TV. <laughs> Remember those things? There used to be boxes, kids. There's not gonna be televisions anymore, just big screens. Don't turn the knob phones. too fast, you'll break it. Oh my gosh, and the rabbit ears. <laughs> Remember the rabbit ears where you got to do all the reception? Yeah. Um, better so, or worse? Better or worse? <laughs> right? Better or worse. Yeah. So, Mike, I'd be on how the long roof did it take? <laughs> That's going to crack me up every time he does that. You have to um, drink. Um, so, <laughs> so, what did you like best about shooting that film, Mike? Uh,. That's a good question. I think, you know, shooting it was the best part of it, I think. Writing it was fun. Writing it just kind of came out of my head as kind of an exercise. And then it was like, oh, this is fun. This would be fun. Let's do this. And actually, I showed it to the other guy who's in the film. And he's a young guy. He's like 26, 27. Maybe he's 28 by now. But he was like, this is great. We should shoot this right now. And I'm like, OK. That's and awesome. He got his other 26 year old friends that are already like working in the field and you know, great cameraman, great sound. We shot it in a day and uh, it was great. I think that is the lesson here is that if you've got an idea, do it. There's so many people it's like, well, I got to shop it around and let me submit it. But really I gotta think go the trick for it. Is, you got to go for it. That, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I've got a book. Uh, you know, that I was, you know, I'm going to submit it to publishers. It's like, they're self-publishing. And yes, of course, everyone wants to play with the big boys, but I think at this uh, time, especially this time in history, you can be your own publishing house. You can be your own producer, your own distributor, like us doing this show. Oh, time to drink. 
Oh, and I see that um, my sister and nephew Owen have joined. Welcome, you guys. Glad to see you here in our second show with uh, Michael Butler Murray. Um, so I've, I've got a bunch more questions, but I'm going to see if anyone else has questions uh, for him. Oh, Trey wants to know, all right, we were talking about some of your stage roles. Um, but you know what? I think in order to talk about some of your work in New York, I think we have to go to New York. Don't you think, David, we should go to New York and Sounds talk good. about life in New York? So let's go out to a place where it's off. Yeah. I had so many good ideas. I really do miss riding the subway. Our theme music. Trey, I know you wanted more music, so this is for you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Michael and I met uh, years ago, many, many years ago in New York. Um, we were both at conservatory together, or as the good people know it, as the Mus American Musical and Dramatic Academy, uh, where we spent uh, every day with a group of uh, other people that are in the chat right now. I want to give a shout out to the other, um, our other classmates from AMDA. We've got Beverly and Trey, and let me just see if there's anybody else from our group who may be watching later. Um, we had a good time. Do, did you have a good time in AMDA, Mike? I had a fantastic time. I loved AMDA. I loved every minute of it. It was great. I learned volumes. Yeah. It was did, were you able to apply then because um, almost all of us went on to be professional actors right after we finished the program in our 20s? Did you really, um, did you feel like that helped prepare you for work and getting roles as an actor? I think it was a, a good starting point. It was, it was good. I worked immediately after getting out of there, but I had a conversation with David Martin, actually, and he broke it to me. And he goes, you know, this is just the beginning. David Martin, for those who don't know, he ran the school. And he said, you know, this is only the beginning. I was like, oh, man, I just spent a whole year and a half. <laughs> but, you know, I did learn a lot. I'll tell you, the, the best lesson I learned from that place is how to be in rehearsal, meaning like no talking, Everything the director or choreographer or anybody else who's got higher status than you, when they're talking, they are the most interesting people in the room. And I was shocked when I got to like big productions and I'd be like, people would just be talking. The director's talking. I'm like, you're going to get kicked out. I don't know. I was just like, how, what are you doing? Shut up. If Harry was here, you'd be dead. You'd be dead. Uh, uh. It was the great Harry Wooliver was um, the, the our the head of the dance program. Correct. Yes. And he's such a legend. He was in the original. Um, correct me here, Beverly and um, Trey. I think the original West Side Story, and he just was absolutely a legend. And he, we were all a little bit nervous because, like, you'd get thrown out of his class for yawning. Um, he would say, you know, dance class starts at 7 a.m., not walking in at 7 a.m., we're starting at 7 a.m., and he would uh, lock the door and gave you a lesson, and you missed two classes, you're completely out of the program. But he was so right. He taught us early on that you, as actors, you're disposable until you're like a yeah, big exactly. name. Nobody has to take any crap from you. You start messing around, you're gone. I'll find any guy, I'll walk out that door and find 10 people who can do what you do. I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> if you were yawning, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, are we boring you? There's a hundred yeah. people who did not get in and you're in their spot that um, we could replace you with. Yes. So that was a very humbling and terrifying lesson. And he was right, you know, in a show, uh, you know, you watch other people learn the hard way that you miss a few too many rehearsals or sometimes one, you're gone, you're out right. because there's 25 people that, uh, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't cast. Oh, you're, we're getting a compliment here that, you know, these sets are blowing my mind, David. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, what else? Um, oh, we were talking about all of our vocal exercises. We all had to do, uh, oh wait, okay, before we go into your vocal exercises, um, oh, Trey's saying that um, Harry Wolliver was in 42nd Street on Broadway. Um, but now, okay, we're getting questions about your national tours of Mamma Mia. And then also you did, um, it was As You Like It at the Goodman in Chicago. Uh -huh. So tell us about Mamma Mia. Uh, Mama Mia I was, I was on the second national tour. I think that was in like, it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was like Oh five or something like that. It was fantastic. It, uh, what can I say? It was the, it was the big show. I think I was mentioning this to you. Like my, my first night was at, uh, the Fox theater and in Atlanta, which is 4,500 seats. And just like walking into that place for tech was scary. But the night I went on, I had a great time. I don't remember any of it. The only thing I remember from that night is I was standing backstage waiting. They're doing the wrap up. They're doing the mega mix. And uh, I come on for the last song with the other dads. Mama Mia is about three dads and the daughter doesn't know who their dads are. She invites all three of them to, to her wedding so she can figure out who it is. And anyway, so I'm backstage and I'm in my four inch silver boots, platform shoes with my spandex waiting to go on. And there's another guy from the ensemble who's also waiting to go on. And he looks over at me and he's been in the show for like a year. And he goes, this is your first time going out here for this, right? And I said, uh-huh. And he goes, it's going to blow your mind. And it's all down here from the, <laughs> it's all downhill from here. And sure enough, the door opens up and there's 4,500 people just <laughs> singing along and lights and it was fantastic. That's you know, awesome. and that's and that's the junky thing of why so many people are like, why would you want to be an actor and live that poor lifestyle? It's like, you know, you just mainline that drug of having an audience watching and have, feeling the energy coming off of the crowd and feeling that excitement and the fact that you're part of that in a creative realm is just, like you said, it's mind blowing and life changing. And then you just chase that, you know, forevermore. And um, not only that you're out there in the big show and, you know, we got, we had full houses like every night. If, if the house was two thirds full, we were like, what the fuck, man. <laughs> but my favorite part was, <laughs> one of the leading actresses was leaving the show and she was like, she'd been in the show for a long time. And she was like, well, I'm going out. And you know what I'd love to do is, you know, I'll probably get to do some Shakespeare or something like that. And I can't wait. And I know what's going to happen. Opening night for Shakespeare. I'm going to walk out on the stage and there'll be like six, <laughs> nine people in the audience. <laughs> Which happens. That's live theater, you know, one night thousands and the next night it's like hi joe this is for you this very special show just for you uh, let's see trey wanted to know um for the movie which role did you play the like which famous actor was your character in oh who who, who oh, i guess famous oh, oh, actor oh, in mama in the uh, movie mama uh, mia which which actor was your role i yeah. was harry the banker so that was colin firth uh -huh. colin firth who, you know, called okay. me for some coaching because his accent was like, yeah. He needed help. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice here we go you. again. Oh, here we go again. They, I, yeah, somebody's making a little song request. Yes, we get it. Um, my 13-year-old, very talented nephew in St. Louis, Owen, wants to know if you have any tips for some... Oh, and that was behind me. If you have any tips for some uh, aspiring actors, what should you do if you're 13 and very talented in St. Louis and you want to be an actor? What would you do, Michael? Um, I would seek out training. I would try and do some community theater. I'd go see the community theater first, make sure it's decent. Um, I have to say, when I was at the University of Vermont and I was thinking about pursuing acting seriously, the first thing I did was get into a community theater production. And I was a lot younger than everybody else. And uh, 
those people really, I ended up going to AMDA because of those people. They all helped me so much. They helped me work up a monologue. They helped me work up a song. They gave me choices of acting schools. They were really into it. They were in like their (laughs) forties. So I was listening to their wisdom and work begets work and doing begets more doing. So get out there and do it. I would have to agree with everything Michael just said. And now, Owen and anybody else listening, you can absolutely do your own work. You can make a short with, you know, your phone in your backyard or, you know, and you draw and so you can do your own sets. And so I think the more you practice, and especially now the kids who are doing their own little mini shows and and doing their own shorts oh my gosh the stuff coming out is incredible and it's first of all it's giving you practice and you're building your skills and you get to see what you like what works what doesn't work and I think that's you know for you know for all artists to be able to do that uh trade that start a youtube channel yeah, like, you know, this is brand spanking new. We, we, um, this is absolutely new territory. I met David over the hall. He lives in Florida, by the way. I'm in Los Angeles and Mike's in LA as well. But the three of us are three completely different remote locations. And yeah, David, one of David's clients is Zoom. And he was, he arrived on the dragon that you saw me arrive <laughs> in the top of the show. I was like, what are you doing? And then it's like raining cookies and, you know, doing all these special effects. And I've never seen anything like that. Like now, like, and he's using OBS, which I was like, that sounds like an uncomfortable, you know, syndrome. But uh, he's like, no, it's the platform all the kids are using on Twitch which I barely know, but you youngins probably know Twitch. So we'll get you David, on Twitch. We'll get Hillary on Twitch. I have one video on Twitch. So, um, <laughs> so David, we're, we are going to have an episode where David's the Twitch Sherpa and takes us all through that. Um, and then we'll have my clubhouse people come on here and we'll do a clubhouse, uh, which we're going to talk about later because I'm excited to talk about that. But all right, so we're getting another question about the Goodman Theater. I grew up in Chicago, so I remember going to the Goodman on field trips, and it is one of the best regional theaters in the country. Owen, if you can get into the Goodman Theater, you got to do it. It's an incredible experience. So what did you do? You did As You Like It. What role did you play? In the oh, I was kind of a chorus member, ensemble. So we did it. Uh, uh, we we the play was placed during Confederate America, so I was in a bluegrass band, and we did all the hey nani nani no, you know, under the green <laughs> leaf trees and stuff like that, all bluegrass. So we had like a six piece band, I think, guitar, banjo, mandolin, upright bass, two fiddles. And uh, it was cream of the crop bluegrass players and me, (laughs) which kind of launched me into this whole study of bluegrass right after that. It was really a a phenomenal experience. It was really great. And I, you You know, I was a cover. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. And I was like, uh, you know, I was a cover for... uh, 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 the clown and uh yeah okay um all right let me see the order of the show oh okay i I think this is a good time um we've got two subjects i'm going to cover here on the subway train i know we're kind of you know what david maybe we maybe this is a good time to go to the pub i know this wasn't planned but david's such a magician let's go have this chat god i need a drink i like it here i do too i thought it was time for a shit uh yeah we need it we need this a lot of we were getting a lot of comments about the stuck subway train which for the new yorkers know how infuriating that is so i think it was causing anxiety of being stuck (laughs) Uh, train that wasn't moving so um okay so we we were talking uh let's go ahead and find out i love that you did all this acting and then you found the magical world of audiobooks can you tell our <laughs> what 
what does that mean? What does it mean to read for audiobooks? Uh, well, it simply means it's the same exact thing as when your parents used to read to you when you were going to bed. It, it literally is that. It's just the genres change your tone. And I'm sticking with that answer. It's still that way. I use this microphone. I'm in my booth right now. And my booth is no, in a bar. No, you're in the pub. You're, and exactly. I, my booth is in a bar. but So I'm always, shut up! <laughs> so, um, but it, it is totally that. Um, funny story, though, and this is all about, like, just doing stuff, is that my wife, Alice, who is also a member of SAG, she's a professional musician, um, she got a notice in her email about Audible looking for narrators and they were running a contest. And if you won the contest, they gave you a 13 week contract, which was enough weeks to get your health insurance, like right out of the gate. Wow. And they were gonna send you all the gear you need and you're in. It's like a great intro to audiobook, the audiobook industry. And so Alice goes, hey, did you get that email from SAG? Did you, do you know about the contest? And I said, no. And she goes, we got to do this. And I was like, yeah, you, you should definitely do that. <laughs> and she was like, don't you want to do this? And I go, my whole life is prepping for several hours and then showing up for somebody who goes, next. So I was like, look, you go ahead and do it. I'll help you do it. I'm a musician, right? I had all the gear and everything. We could do a good job. I was like, I'll I'll help you do a good job and, and it'll be great. And then someone will listen to your sample for 30 seconds and go, next. And she was like, you are so jaded. So anyway, then we get to her time to audition. I have everything set up. She's doing it. I'm her recording tech. We do it. And then I'm like, as she's reading, I'm like, well, that's a good choice. That's good. I wouldn't do it that way. I know how I'd do it. And then everything was all set up, so I just did it. And I ended up becoming a finalist in the contest. Out of like 1,200 people, they chose 20. I was in that group. And then I won the contract. Wow. And that was six years ago or so. It was six years ago? Yeah. You never know where life will take you, huh? You just never and, know. Right. Michael has shown me a little bit of this world, and it's 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 booming now. I think a lot of people are so tired of reading text and reading social media, and they want to go out and take a walk. They want, you know, while they're cleaning their house, they want to hear a book, or they're driving. You know, a lot of driving. people. What we used to call books on tape, and Michael has corrected me, saying I'm too old, and it's audiobooks. So don't make the same old person mistake because i remember what <laughs> was <laughs> books on tape and he's like no there's that's no more so tape. cute yeah the only What's tape that left in the world is um i was gonna go find a scotch tape but in the bar i don't have <laughs> uh so so he had he built a little booth uh because one of his other side jobs is carpentry which we'll find out about in a second and uh, he, he, he gets these books, he reads, what, what, you said like an hour at a time, and then go take a break, and then like how long, how long does it, do you sit down for and read? Uh, I, about an hour, a, uh, yes, an hour at a time, and that, in that time, I can knock out about a half hour. So I do about two finished hours a day, that's four hours of recording, I read in the morning to uh, research and prep the next book I'm going to read. And then I take a lot of breaks. You know, you got to give your voice a rest. You got to give your attitude a rest. You can't just like, oh, I'm just going to read in there for four hours. But like, then you'll just be like, and then the guy went into the room and, oh, scary. Huh? And then he hacked me with a mallet. You know, that's not going to work. You got to, you got to be fresh. So, uh, you know, I, I break it up by going to the gym or playing guitar or, or, you know, doing whatever, going to the grocery store and then coming back. So like what are, besides vocal fatigue, uh, which Michael shared that he, he used to get very worn out, but because of some exercises, including a little device we had at AMDA, if anyone wants to guess in the chat, either uh, 
what it is that we carried over, Mike carried over, that he still uses as a vocal warm up exercise if he gets a little mush mouth. And for uh, Owen and any other actors out there, if anyone wants to take a guess of what, what was the vocal technique warm up that we still use or Michael uses. Uh, all right, we're gonna wait for some guesses to come in. But in the meantime, like you talked about vocal fatigue, reading out loud for anybody who talks all day knows it's very taxing, but it's your own words. But if you're reading somebody else's words, what's, yeah. is, is that the biggest challenge or like books that are boring that you don't like? What would you say there's, some of the challenges? There's all kinds of challenges. That is one of them. A guy, a person who cannot turn a phrase is hard to read down, you know, or uh, sometimes I read a book called Welcome to the Universe by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's total science guy, him and two other professors from Princeton, and it was like quantum physics. So that's, <laughs> you know, it's a challenge. Um, you just got to find your way around it. Well, that, what I will say about all that is it's always finding the rhythm. Every, I have a rhythm when I speak, every person who writes falls into a rhythm as soon as you find the rhythm everything gets easier and even the technical books you you i get into the rhythm of that and they get into their rhythm in the book and so there's that but just speaking for several hours a day is taxing on your voice especially if you know you don't really know what you're doing and even me that's had a lot of training I have constant reminders. This isn't the tool you're talking about, but this is something my wife and many singers I know are very big on. And that's the use of the straw where you mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. blow through the straw. Mm. And if you ever take a straw and do this, mm, it's like what we used to do at AMDA, lip trilling. It makes you support from your diaphragm. And when I'm getting vocally fatigued, I'll just like, I will read a little bit through the straw and like, it just reminds me for a couple of pages and then I'll go back and do it again. And it saves my voice, you know? Well, Trey was guessing some of our exercises of crawling on the ground or mommy made me mash my M&Ms, but we were actually thinking of the drum roll, please, the cork. How many of you remember the cork and how many of you remember where it goes? <laughs> the gloom of the sea. What was that? <laughs> I can't even remember. The gloom of the, sea, the gloom of the sky hung brooding <laughs> over all. <laughs> the landlord knew and she were flew. So the technique is to have a cork in your mouth and try to enunciate and it makes your mouth muscles have to do double duty and work extra hard. And then when you take it out, your enunciation is beautiful. Huh? So for any of you public speakers out there, um, I know we got Rebecca who does a lot of talking. Uh, you can warm it up by putting that cork in your mouth, trying to do some tongue twisters, take it out and see how beautifully, oh, lip trilling, absolutely. But, rubber but baby, sure. baby buggy bumpers, yes. But make sure, make sure. <laughs> better buy the bigger rubber baby buggy bumpers. Um, make sure you, you actually look how to use the thing because there is a method and you can like screw your jaw up by using it oh. and not do the thing. So make sure you consult a professional. <laughs> consult a professional. Speaking of professionals, uh, you've done over a hundred audiobooks, and uh, my new friend Rebecca wants to know how do we, how do you get in? Or anybody else watching who's interested and says, you know, I like talking, I like reading. How do I get in on some of this easy audio reading money? When it comes well, I have to tell you, there's actually no more room. Uh, we're filled up with narrators, so yeah, you can't. I guess. <laughs> I would That's say that, like we tell it like it is here at Hanging with Hillary. There's no lion here in a bar. I would, I would we say this you can, technically or uh, uh, professionally, if you want to get started narrating books, you can go to acx.com, which is run by Audible, and you can uh, you can audition for books in there. But here's the thing: this is what I tell all people who want to get into audiobook narration. Before you get the gear, before you do anything, take a chair, a light, go into your closet, 
I'm 100% serious about this. Go into your closet and read in there for, start with a half an hour. But every time, read out loud, every time you make, make a mistake, stop and go back to the beginning of the sentence you were just reading. And if you can handle that for two hours, then consider doing it because that is the gig. A lot of people can't be closed up like that. So, so and it's, it's not it for be, people who are claustrophobic. It can be tedious. You know, it's, it's fun. And, you know, for me, I was, I was halfway there. I had all the gear and I was technically into recording and stuff like that. And I happened to like the sound of my own voice. So that was great. <laughs> and I can read. So I was like three quarters of the way there. And being literate is, yeah, at least half the deal. Uh, but the I have ACX. And also there's a great website. I hope I don't get this wrong. I believe it is the Narrator's Roadmap. Narrator's Roadmap. I believe that's what it's called. It's an exceptional site. Okay. I just yeah, cross-check that, that for me. Would you, Hillary? Thank you. I just put it in the chat. I'm, I, yeah. I can only multitask so much. Yeah, I, I'll get to the point where I can Google as someone's talking and not like where you, where you can't really see it. Um, uh, I was going to ask, oh, I had a really good question and then it just flew out of my head. All right, I well, got while it. you're thinking, I'll just say that oh, I love oh, the idea no. of a job where I can lock the door <laughs> and put a sign that said, this is world, leave me alone for the next four hours. I'm working. <laughs> Thank you. David. <laughs> that's out, that does You're not cool. sound bad to me at all. Oh, the signs on David's door. We have to leave him alone for four hours. Okay, world, entire world, you have to leave David alone. Oh. Yeah. But you know, oh. that surprises me because you're, you're a social person, David. What I want to be. <laughs> you are. David and I have never met in real life. Time. What's that? We all need some alone time now and then. Oh my gosh, we totally do. It's the point I was going to make before is like Michael and all the other um, divas, as we were called in our AMDA class, uh, you know, we were with each other every day. We sang for each other, danced for each other, uh, performed, did monologues. And so we really got to know each other's skills inside and out. And uh, oh, thank, thanks, Rebecca. I'm really glad you stopped by. <laughs> Um, and I cast Michael in a show a couple years ago as Einstein and I said, could you pull it off? Cause he had the wig and let me tell you his vocal skills. I was like, I don't remember you having this voice. Like you could speak obviously, <laughs> but your vocal technique was so flawless. And I was astounded. I was saying, I guess reading a hundred books out loud really brought your technique to the next level yeah, that might so be. <laughs> the voice it was is incredible instrument. yeah it, it was take, absolutely it incredible practice. the work you did yeah just like musicians have to do the vocal warm-up well same thing for um for actors and people doing voiceover but speaking of music uh i am so happy that um we have got yet uh, one of my favorite portions of the show, and we're doing it brand new. You're, you're the first ones to see this, where I asked Michael, if you could perform anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, because David's kind of magical and can make this happen, where would you perform? And let's see if there's any guesses that come up in the, uh, in the chat of where Michael would perform. I'm going to wait till I get three guesses before I tell you. Okay, so... Michael's hair was not that color 30 years ago. <laughs> Thanks true. a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so it's like, but David has cool, colorful hair. I well, like both our gentlemen's hair. Without the Arctic Fox, <laughs> we'd be twins. <laughs> <laughs> is it Arctic Fox or Silver Fox? Uh, uh, Arctic Fox like is it. the brand of blue that I use. It's the, the, oh, the company yeah. that makes my, so we've my got blue silver and purple. Fox and an Arctic Fox. So I'm the Arctic I'm that, Fox you know. is the Silver Fox, exactly. Love. And both your wives would have to agree. And that's how it works here with hanging with Hillary. All right. No one's guessing where you would perform. I think there may be a slight delay. That's why. Oh, we got one guess. Um, oh, two guesses. So Trey guessed Madison Square Garden. Uh, that would be the second. And, yes, for sure. 
Nope. Uh, Marla Bronson said Broadway. Uh, yeah, I should have said that. that would be a good one no, but we got something. Uh, we got something. Uh, and then uh, our third guest is Moulin Rouge. Yeah. <laughs> what we got was even better than that. He picked a beautiful place. Red Rocks in Colorado is the beautiful amphitheater. And we're going to hear a brand new, well, an original song from Michael Butler Murray in Red Rocks, Colorado. David, take us there. That's a beautiful Red Rocks. Isn't that gorgeous? You guys, Yay. I totally don't. Oh. We could have the cheering people, David. You can only hear the people that come up. There we go. Uh, better than the Grand Ole Opry. See, I got my guitar in here, my little cubicle. Oh, what I'm are sorry, you playing for, for us? <laughs> what are you playing for us tonight, Mike? Well, this is a very soul searching, heartfelt tune called Pete Duty Punched Me in the Face. <laughs> True story. True story uh, about a friend of mine and me. We were about 12 years old, I think. And uh, yeah, we were playing a game and uh, things got a little heated. And that's what the whole song is about. Do you, would you like to hear it? Are you ready for that? I would love to hear it. Please, Mike, tell me about Pike, Mike Dooley. Pete Dooley. Tell me tell about, Pete. about Pete. <laughs> yes what happened, what happened? uh well no, no, in song in song that was your that was your cue that was your pattern cue oh okay uh well <laughs> pete duty I, I haven't talked to him in a long time but back then he was a good friend of mine no, and uh, hold the story hold the story I, oh i'm sorry i'm being directorial okay mike please tell us what you'd like if you'd like and then play when you like Oh, okay. I'm gonna close I think the song really speaks for itself. It has all the details of what actually happened. So why don't we discuss it after? Thanks for the love tap, Mrs. Judy. And when you're ready to hit me, I want you please just to let me know. Well, it 
it's a good thing that it happened Cause in the end it helped me grow Listen, if you're gonna sling insults, keep your distance Or better yet, use your cell phone Even better, write a song and spread it all over cyberspace ha! And you'll get him back like I'm getting him back And I laugh at his disgrace Day Pete Duty punch me in the face. I lie, lie in my face. I lie, lie in my Thanks, Pete. Bravo! Bravo! That's fantastic. David, let's bring us back to that cozy cut. Oh, you want to, we can be in the bar. Yeah, the bar is a good place to go after. I almost after forgot this. the bridge. Oh, I never <laughs> forgot the bridge. That was great. That was really great. He's hanging that up in the bar rack. Yeah, yeah. tracing. you quit Sorry, your day man. job, Michael. What's that? Was that? Fantastic. Trey says you can quit your day job and just do music. <laughs> so I got I got a question. When you get punched in the face, there's a there's a sliding scale of getting punched in the face. There's all the way at this end, it's zero percent your fault. You're standing talking to your friends and someone just comes over and crazy man punches in the face. Then on this end, it's a hundred percent your fault. You were basically, you know, I'm going out to get punched in the face today. In this story, where are we? <laughs> Actually, he did. He pinned me down. It was one of those things where you're 12, 13, and it's like, you know, you're kind of playing a game. And I think for a little bit, he might have done the thing where he's dangling the spit over oh, my face. No. So he no. got me down. He was bigger than me, but we were fucking around and stuff. And I was definitely giving him crap and so it was it was 50-50. I was kind of asking for it. But what he did was he went to just like kind of just miss my face and he oh, ended up hitting scare, yeah. he hit me he hit me in the nose and when he did it he, he was like oh he, no are you all was, right are you all right he was more scared but, than you <laughs> but hey you know what i was writing a comedy song and i thought the day pete duty punched me in the face that's a great title for a tune just the name <laughs> pete duty i mean come on that right there sets it up so and you know what? They own a hardware store called Depend on Duty. No. I think that's true story. Do they and know even that if, you're allowed to change your name in this country? I mean, it's a thing you can do. That, that, that no, shop, I think it was founded by Pete's grandfather. It had been around for, you know, decades, since the 50s, I believe. Decades of proud I duties. worked there for a little while. I worked at Depend on Duty with Pete Duty. <laughs> oh, after he punched you in the face. Was that a long the time after. Time? We were actually, you know, we were, I was about to go to college and uh, yeah, I had that job with Pete. Pete gave me a job now, and we drive to work together every day listening to Howard Stern. <laughs> oh, Howard Stern, Howard Stern. Yeah, he I remember listening to Howard Stern before um, we had on. Now was that the only before we yeah, when it was still books on tape. Yes. You know, I think it I remember definitely okay books on tape. Yes. Good God. Uh so was that the only time in your life you've been punched in the face? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> I've been punched in the face before. I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> you're a nice guy, Michael. So I would. I'm really very surprised. <laughs> I was up to no good. We don't need to revisit it. Uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> I'm a rough guy. You know. I'm a rough guy. I got a checkered past, Hillary. Uh, you swing hammers. That I know. Oh, talk about yeah. Talk about your um, your woodcrafting uh, side hustle. You're a very talented woodworker. So. I. Uh, when I was living in Chicago, I lived in Chicago from like 1993 to 1998. And when I got there, I needed a job. And a guy I met through theater 
um, he was like, I was fixing things. I don't know how he knew this, but like, he was like, you're a better carpenter than me. And I have this great job building sets at a photography studio. Oh. You should come with me. And I did. And I met the boss there. And uh, like a few weeks later, there was a massive blizzard in Chicago. And I call, he called me and he said, everyone is snowed in and can't make it. If you can make it here, you have a job. And so I was like, I'll just walk. <laughs> I, ended up just, I walked to the train station. I took the train, you know, and I got there. And then I worked there every, my whole time I was in Chicago. And making sets is great because you make, we made all kinds of stuff. It was for like the Spiegel and Sears catalogs and stuff like that. You'd build kitchens, you'd build log cabins, you'd build patios. It was all fake. What do you mean log cabins? What's that? Oh, you mean log cabins like for sets? We had a log cabin interior set with like a stone fireplace. Yeah. Wow. And so- That's fun. I did all that stuff and there were a few carpenters in there that were like real carpenters that would after when they weren't working at the set, they'd go out and they'd get a kitchen to build or something like that. And I so they'd say, you want to come? And I'd be like, I don't know how to do that. And they were like, you know, 80%, I'll, I'll show you how to hang the cabinet on hinges or hang the door cabinet, the, the door of the cabinet on hinges. And so when I got out of there, I, I when I got to LA, I started doing set work again and they were paying like $16 an hour or something like it was ridiculous. So I just started doing regular carpentry. And so I, then I started building a lot of cabinets, a lot of shelf units, a lot of custom, like somebody wants to have a nice office or something. And I would trick the place out. I think it's good to have all those skills that you have because, yes. you know, one of the things I love, you know, when David and I were talking about putting the show together is that when you're a creative person, you're an artist, you're an actor, it's very rare that you're like, I'm just going to be a theater actor. And then you do show, 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 show for the rest of your life. It's usually not that linear where build your you skill set. Right. You build, yeah. And you pick up others that are like, hey, I can do that and I need to eat tomorrow. So I'll figure this out or figure that out. And you know I love I how love? you to like to audiobooks like that's and I love that pivot that you did. Yeah, I, I love the idea of someone up in Chicago right now sitting in their cozy living room, listening to an uh, an, an audiobook on their iPhone and going, this "Sounds like the dude who hung the cabinets in our kitchen a few years ago." <laughs> Doesn't it sound just like the dude, that nice guy that hung our cabinets? Could be. It could be. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And they start, and then it's like, if they tune into this, it's like, wait a second. This is the guy who read Moby Dick last week. <laughs> and Peter Duty's out there like, it's the guy punching the face. That's the guy punching the face. <laughs> oh, some good karma. Um, Holy cow. I can't believe that's been almost an hour, you guys. That's crazy. Um, we're going to see if we have any last questions um, coming up. We, I mean, we had like probably three hours of content to be able to talk about, like, I could do this all day, but um, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to see if there's any more questions in the chat. Um, anything else coming up? No, I think we're going to um, head back to our talk show set to wrap up some things. You guys, this was so much fun. To... Sorry, get rid of the crowd. <laughs> no, I think the crowd uh, lends itself. Because that performance was so good. Did I mention that, how good your performance was? Oh, thank it was you. really fun. And how did it feel performing at Red Rock? Amazing. Amazing. A little cold, you know, it's Colorado. And the air is a little Colorado. thin, so it was a little hard to breathe, but I was okay. It threw me a little bit, as you saw in the bridge. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, now you put and, that and on I'm a guitarist. You know how critical we are. You know, guitarists are about other guitarists, and, and you were amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
uh, and the fact now you can say that you performed at Red Rock. So, yes. you know, check that off the bucket list. Right. That's going that. on my resume. Nice. I know. So now I'm going to do my hosting duties and say, if you have not, speaking of duties, uh, go ahead and subscribe if you've not already as we're building our crowd. We'd really love that. And I'll let you know when we've got um, more shows coming up. Let you spread the word to your friends. Next week, uh, we're in for another musical treat uh, yeah. where uh, uh, my friend, funny man, funny, funny, funny from Chicago, because all the best are from, right, Mike? The good guys come from Chicago. Sure. We've got Bill Larkin. Bill Larkin is going to come on this show and perform. And if you have not seen him perform live, you're in for a treat. So Bill's we're going to be best. back on Wednesdays, back on Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Hawaii and Europe. You got to check your own times. But uh, that's us. I'm Hillary. This is Michael. And we've got, of course, David, my fabulous co-host who did these incredible sets. He's been working all the magic here behind the background. Follow him on Twitch where he gets to play his guitar. And if you think these graphics are fun, just wait to see what he has done on Twitch. Yeah, it's insane. So that has been popping up all throughout by our bot in the chat. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mike, so much for being our very first guest. We did it. Yay. My pleasure. That was Thanks a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for hanging with me. You were fantastic. So thank you. Um, until next week, you guys be safe, be well, and ride us out of here, Dragon. Woohoo! Thanks for hanging with me. Have a great week. Thanks for hanging.